justice activist. Um, she was born in Northern Rakhine State in, 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 in the Burma. In, uh, her family fled when she was very young, in 1995, uh, to Thailand, uh, where she grew up, and they moved to Canada um, uh, in 2011. Uh, Yasmin has served as a president of the Rohingya Human Rights Network, a nonprofit group led by activists across Canada advocating and raising public awareness of the Rohingya genocide. She's also worked on various projects such as Time to Act, Rohingya Voices Exhibition with the Canadian Union Museum for Human Rights, Genocide Learning Tool with the Montreal Holocaust Museum, and the anthology. She's a contributor to the anthology I Am Rohingya, where she published her poetry. And for those of you who, uh, uh, who uh, um, <laughs> this is, um, it, it's a beautiful book that she gave me a copy on Saturday, which I'm really grateful for, and it's, it's on my bedside table now, so I, um, I'm vlogging the book, so please you get on Amazon and buy it. It's, it won't cost you much, but it's an extraordinary um, cultural moment of giving voice and agency to uh, to Rohingya uh, um, poets and authors. Um, in 2021, she was named on the Feminist uh, 100, the Gender Security Project list of 100 women in the Global South, working in foreign policy, peace building, law, activism, and development. Um, uh, Yasmin, uh, um, a very young person, has emerged especially powerfully in the last three or four years as among the most fearless, uh, vocal, and influential uh, voices advocating for the Rohingya um, ethnic minority uh, in this it's global diaspora, but especially uh, those who remain in Burma and those who are now um, in the enormous um, refugee camp in Cox's Bazaar in, in, in neighboring Bangladesh. Uh, she has impressed us time and time again with her the depth of her commitment, her knowledge, her eloquence, her advocacy, her tirelessness. And uh, we are so honored uh, to have her here with us first for the conference on Saturday. So for those of you who joined us, you know, uh, I think an extraordinary event, uh, and we're even we're just as excited to have her describe to us uh, her work and the situation um, of her people today. So please let, join me in welcoming uh, our, our, our very dear guest and friend, um, Yasmin Kalua, for her talk entitled, Working at Genocide, a Community Struggle for Agency. today to hear, listen, and really see us, which is, I think, the most important part in the journey that I had um, when IGMAP reached out and wanted me to come to share some of the experience um, on the field as a practitioner. I was like, I don't, I don't really know if I have enough qualifications to do this, but I would like to share whatever I've learned on the field. Um, uh, if it works, if it helps. Um, so thank you for seeing me, and thank you for you know for the work that you do in seeing others who are um, really tremendously struggling. Now, um, the reason why I named this uh, Rohingya genocide community struggle for agency is because oftentimes in mass atrocity and in genocide, we often think in a very, very restrictive terms, and usually we would resort, well, we as a global community would resort to uh, things like humanitarianism and responses that are um, for the urgent um, help or 
you know, really just thinking about how to protect and provide for the population that are displaced. And often we don't acknowledge that the community also do their part in surviving. And I emphasize time and time again, as I learn more and more as, as an activist, as an advocate, is that survival itself is a skill. Through mass atrocity and genocide, people don't just survive. They have to be able to provide for themselves, for their family, community organize themselves in different ways in order to brace for those sort of impact. And this is one way. And I think you might have guessed what this is. It's a solar panel. And that side is a really bright light that is generated through the solar panel. And because during the exodus in, nine, uh, in 2017, when the genocidal campaign, which some of you might have heard about, or learned about, or read about, um, the one thing that a lot of families actually carry all the way from within Rakhine State to uh, Bangladesh, without even thinking, you know, there are just only a few things that they can actually, you know, just like people who are um, dealing with uh, houses that are on fire, you really don't get a lot of selection of things that you can bring so the solar panel was one of the necessity that they decided they're going to bring because that was the only thing that could help us to actually communicate with the outside world in Wakhan State in the very restricted conditions that the um, uh, Myanmar authoritarian regime has actually imposed upon us for a very long time. And this was, again, another survival tool in the camps. But let me not talk too much about that yet. Um, there's a little bit more about agency, about exercising our, our survival skills, but let's talk a little bit about Rohingya. Briefly, Rohingya people are indigenous people um, of Rakhine State, and um, there are about three million Rohingya all around the world. Um, only 600,000 people are left in the country, in, in Rakhine State, and that was, you know, as a result of gradual and many, many waves of violence that have forced people to have to be displaced. Now, you can see all around that there are many, many other areas that Rohingya are populated. Some of these numbers are very, very underreported, and the numbers are low for a reason because there's not enough data that has been gathered. Um, and because the precarious conditions, security issues that would come with people exposing themselves in certain areas like India or other areas um, in, in across Asia. Um, so people don't really you know, tell uh, researchers that they are actually Rohingya. So there is uh, about over a million people in uh, Cox's Bazaar now who have fled um, about 70, sorry, 740,000 people who have left in 2017 due to the genocidal campaign um, by the military and the security forces, and um, about 120,000 people are currently, you know, during the trial run, um, there is such a thing as a trial run during a genocidal project, uh, process, sorry. Um, this process is actually marginalized and, and put about 120,000 Rohingya into internment camps, or what is called internally displaced people's um, camps. And this actually is a, a very recurrent theme all across Myanmar, not just within the Rohingya region or, or Rakhine region, because this possession for accumulation always results in displacement and internal displacement becomes uh, uh, a way for military and the authoritarian regime to actually impose apartheid-like conditions or open-air prisons. Now, there are several turning points, and I'm sorry for a little bit, a bit of a boring data and information and timeline. I think it will help you to understand a little bit of the context and, and things that I will talk about later on. But 1942, during the World War II, a lot of chaos around the world. Um, Rohingya decided to side with the British in World War II. The kind people and the rest of Myanmar sided with Japanese force obviously forcefully on both sides. Um, but that created a rift between the two communities where they could coexist prior to this, they no longer can. And the hatred was actually, or, or the, the 
the disintegration of the two communities actually have been weaponized by the Myanmar military to ensure that Rohingya can no longer actually play a major role in decision making around what um, they would like to contribute to the society in Rakhine State. And the term Rakhine, Rakhine State, actually came from that very, very initiative to ensure that there is a disparity between uh, Rakhine people and Rohingya people, whereas before, the area or the region is called Aragon. And that is what we call you know, the, the, the homeland. If you talk to any Rohingya, we would usually refer to it as Aragon, but for for the you know for the sake of no more confusion, adding on to your side, let's just call it Rakhine. Now, in 1982, prior to that, the military gained control of the country. They decided to stage a coup in 1962. After that, the country descended to into chaos. They have gained control of the social, economic, and political um, landscape of the country. 90% of economic enterprises in the country is controlled to this day by the military. Therefore, um, they were able to enact the 19 citizenship, uh, 1982 citizenship law, and that was actually a pinnacle of the policy that was actually um, later on becoming the, the, the um, core of the genocidal policies. That was you know, the, the central policy that other policies have followed. So 1982 law have actually um, stripped a lot of Rohingya off of their citizenship. But some, this is not to be confused, some of the Rohingya to this day still have citizenship. What we don't have as a group of people is ethnic uh, pin cards, scrutiny cards. There were all different variations of what has followed the 1982 law. And that 1982 law did not right away stop Rohingya from participate, uh, participating in political processes, but then it actually created barriers after barriers after barriers. And slowly, in around um, the election time, the second election after the NLD won the first one, they have completely stopped Rohingya from being able to actually access anything um, that is you know, a semblance of political power or, or negotiation. So that has turned into the national verification card. And this is important, maybe not as important as you know the rest of the materials, but this actually the card when you file the application, because in, in, in Myanmar we would have to understand that you know in, in, in any sort of um, uh, uh, dealings with the <coughs> authorities or, or governments, we would have to show them some sort of IDs, right? Just like anywhere else. But in this case, if we don't have IDs um, that are showing that we are um, indigenous, and, and that's you know, the term that is used in, um, in Myanmar, if it's not showing that we are indigenous, we cannot vote, we cannot actually access education unless our parents and our grandparents have IDs that are shown to be indigenous. If there are ethnic status, if there's any hyphenation whatsoever in terms of religious or ethnic minorities, we don't have the same power as the Bamar Buddhists, who are the majority, and who are basically informing the ideology of, of the Tapada, of the Myanmar military. Now, national verification card in the application, it asks us where we uh, immigrated from. What if I was born there? <laughs> what if my great grandparents are from there? So you can already see that the, the actual policy which was used to justify, you know, oh, we have a citizenship verification process. But no, it's actually started out to be discriminatory from the get-go. Now, moving forward to the 90s, during the 90s, there were many, many waves of violence, which is why I'm here today. Um, I've had to leave the country, you know, during the, the, the many waves of violence um, uh, that my parents foresaw that it was not a good future for us. Then, 2000. 11 was a trial run 2011-12 in Sitwe, which is the capital of Rakhine State. There were many, many thriving Rohingya businesses. And there's a business hub within the capital that are all, you can, you can actually see an entire stretch of the street that are all belonging to Rohingya. And there are other Rakhine businesses as well, but they were actually coexisting. But that 
gave the military the idea. They strategized to test this out and burn down the houses. This was the first attempt at the scorched earth campaign to, um, in this size. And 120,000 people have actually been displaced and forced into this open air prison. To this day, they still are deprived of food necessities and you know, other means of, of, uh, of livelihood. That trial run did not gain any sympathy or re repercussion from the international community. Therefore, the military is emboldened, and even during all this, you know, while, while this is all happening, in the backdrop, there was an election. The NLD won, you know, the new uh, League of Democracy actually won um, landslide. They actually won really, really huge um, in the parliament, but still, in the Myanmar political landscape, in the parliament, the military have actually written themselves into the parliament to gain at least 15% of the seats. And when the law is going to be passed, it can only pa be passed if 75% of the parliament actually agrees. So that actually creates a condition where the NLD or you know, other politicians have to work and compromise with the military. And that was the constitution of 2008 where military have written that and written themselves into the political system. Um, now, that trial run was successful. 2016 came, started, there was a starting of the waves of violence. There were a lot of surveilling of people, surveilling of uh, houses at night. Men goes to hide in the jungle because they are targeted. As soon as they're arrested, they're going, either they're kidnapped and disappear or they are uh, going to be arrested and not given the just trial. So they will be sentenced for at least two years. A lot of this is really, really detrimental to the, to the well-being of the community. Where women are left at home at night. They're left to their own device. This is why I'm saying that this whole genocidal process is our gender. Um, then we moved on to 2017 where the genocidal campaigns were actually materialized and carried out in a full extent. They actually moved a two very ruthless battalions who were actually trained by Western liberal democracy. Germany, US, <coughs> Canada, and many other countries have joined in to, to train some of these uh, personnel. And these people were moved into a kind state very early on in the year, and then uh, they carried out the, the atrocity on uh, beginning on August 25th, 2017, and that involved, sorry, let me just drink some water. while not seeing it. 
but also are kept in those compounds you know, for days in order for them to actually absorb all of it. Once they're there, being humiliated, put in that position, they're also now kept alive. The military will leave, pile all the bodies onto trucks, leave, put all these bodies into mass graves outside of the village so that these women would not have closure, would not get to see these bodies of loved ones in Cuba. And once they decided to leave, and then this, is, this goes to show that the women in my community have had to do so much invisible labor leading up to this, they decided to gather all of their belongings, all of their kids. You know, many women have you know, upwards to like six children. They gather all of them. And one of this story is, uh, if you have a, a, an opportunity to go to DC, I would really recommend for you to go and check out the exhibit at, um, at the US Holocaust Museum. The story um, that I had the opportunity to help translate was about a woman who actually, everyone was killed, um, every male relative of hers was killed, including her young 10 year old, and six other children that she had, she gathered them up and she took off to Bangladesh, making sure that every single one of her children actually made it, and they did. This is labor that women actually put into, and I don't think we celebrate them enough. Um, there is more so, you know, uh, in, in the Western media, I only see women prize, you know, women in, in positions of victim, victimization that often just catches the headline. Um, not necessarily these kind of stories, so really check it out if you can. So this all comes together. This is the unfinished business that the general uh, Min Online, who's the genocide mastermind, who now actually appointed himself after the coup to be a prime minister. He said, oh, this is a Bengali problem because he doesn't actually refer to us as uh, Rohingya. And that's the denial of self, right? The process of alienation. And uh, he, he said that you know, he has to deal with this unfinished business. The, the, the Bengali problem is, is lingering too long. Now, just to summarize it for you, the genocidal campaign began with discriminatory policies. Denial of self-identification as a community, as and as an individual, because there's two prongs to this, ethnic status and um, individual cards, ID cards. Now, there's also limitations on who they can marry. They cannot marry outside of you know, Rohingya race. They can not bear more than two children. This is policy only rolled out onto Rohingya. Penalization of movement, which is still seen until today. There have been so many Rohingya upwards of two, three hundred Rohingya who actually were just arrested earlier this year um, and put to jail for two years because they left the confine of those, you know, uh, 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 set out by the military um, regime. There are also forced labor and extortion on a daily basis. This is how Rohingya um, labor and Rohingya um, wealth goes into uh, funds the, the military economy. Now, there's also denial of process that I've already talked about, segregation, denial of access to basic needs, hospital, education, other facilities are all banned for us. Other than that, we have to figure out a way to pay bribes, find some money, and give it to you know authorities in order to actually access some of those. So there's a lot of debts that are also um, result of, of that stalling tactics. One other thing that I want to really highlight is the bulldozing of the Rohingya villages. I call it space suicide. It's actually um, taking inspiration from uh, uh, the, the um, academic terms that talks about Palestinian and their struggles. Um, space suicide equals invisibilization, but we don't see that very clearly, until this happened, over 360 villages have been torched and burned and bulldozed in about four months. Now, this is the clear um, example. This was actually taken um, off the satellite image by Human, uh, Human Rights Watch. 
And this was actually the remains of the villages. And this was afterwards, in about uh, early 2018. So there's an attempt, a clear attempt, to actually erase not only the crimes that took place, but also the existence of Rohingya, where it's as if Rohingya had never lived there before. And there is a clear connection in a collectivist society. It's not only a group of people connecting to um, you know, other groups of people, it's also people connection to land. Land is identity. As much as collectivity as a, as, as a Rohingya, we're not just identifying ourselves as Rohingya just, just, you know, just for the fun of it. We also acknowledging that you know, we are connected to this land, we are indigenous to this land, this is the land of our forefathers. And stripping us off of citizenship has many implications. This is one of them. It is becoming more and more justified for them to not only dispossess us violently, but also legally. When you actually don't have identifications, can you claim that this was your forefather's um, lands? You cannot. There is no, you know, there is really no proof, uh, documentations to show that. So as a result, we make a contribution in nation building because we were actually parts and parcels of the nation building process. We were the first to actually let down the arms and tell the unification uh, 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 committee that yes, we are going to join you and let's form Myanmar or Burma at the time and let's gain independence from the British. Lost. Cultural vibrancy also lost. Here's one example of why it's so attractive, this, this piece of land. It has the access to the Bay of Bengal. And if you know anything about the Belt and Roads Initiative, this is a very key strategic area. Jokpu Port, as seen in this map, is a very strategic area and access to the Bay of Bengal in order to become a port city or a port for, you know, for, for goods and services, for other things to be you know, transported, import and export. Jokpu Port was actually initiated in 2011. And if you remember earlier, I talked about 2011 being the time, the trial run. And that trial run is actually uh, uh, very important because there was a, a, a huge scandal or rumors that two Rohingya men actually raped one Rakhine woman. And that became the uh, 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 incinerator almost in terms of um, really igniting the conflict that was lingering. And then eventually um, Rohingya people were, you know, there was a lot of mobs against Rohingya, violence were, were um, were really perpetrated against Rohingya by you know, other ethnic groups, specifically Rakhine people. But prior to that happening, there was a protest against this port being built by Rakhine people. But there was a diversion right away as soon as there was any resistance to this being built. Because it's, again, resource extraction. And this was built as part of the special economic, economic zones. So a lot of lands were emptied out bulldozed. Rohingya no longer there. The pipelines built, you know, from Rakhine coast, access to Jokpu port, all the way up to China, Kunming, United States. Are we seeing a little bit of a justification of why there is this strategy to actually push Rohingya out of the land, kill them as many times as possible, make sure they're fearful and the women carry the, the trauma so they don't dare coming back, and brand them so that eventually, if they try to come back, the perpetrators will see from far away who these people are. You with me so far? Okay, perfect. Now, trigger warning. This is disturbing, very, very disturbing. You have to close your eyes, turn out, and come back. I would not be offended. Please take care of the mental health. Massacre in Indian. These men were actually photographed by the security forces. And this was actually one of the evidence that was used at the International Court of Justice at the provisional measure hearing um, by the Gambia in order to incite the justification for the Gambia to actually lodge the complaint that there may be a genocide taking place uh, against Rohingya. Now, these 
men were about to be shot, killed, and pushed into a shallow grave. This was the result. And this was a stark reality um, of what it means to be a Bohemia. Our lives just didn't matter. Now, talking about another very triggering um, topic. I'll rush through it as fast as I can. Rampant target, targeted sexual and gender-based violence is done, as I've mentioned, to strike fear in the community. But also, it's a weaponization of women's survival as a tactic of annihilation. And this results in genocidal rape. Because when women in the community, in a conservative society like Bohemia, actually is raped by men outside of the community who have no respect for them. It's a power dynamic, power imbalance thing. As we know it, rape is not about sexuality. It's not about attraction. It's about power dynamic. And when it's the military personnel doing this to a group of people who've been so marginalized, it is a way to actually end their lineage. When women are impregnated by these military men, they cross over to the uh, Caucasus Bazaar, to Bangladesh. They're shunned by their own community. They're shunned by their own families. They're shunned by their own husbands. And they no longer have an option because by the time they realize they're pregnant, it's too far into the terms. In a conservative society, even if they're able to seek abortion, which the facility was not available at the time, it was already too late. And a lot of women were actually bearing the burden, continued to do so, and less and less people were actually reporting to have or the children out of rape. Only about 10,000 uh, women reportedly to have you know, given birth to uh, children out of rape. It is also, women's, women's body is used as a site of struggle. Just follow, follow along with me a little bit. In a conservative society, where Rohingya are continuously facing conditions that are limiting and, um, and precarious, especially in gendered, as, in gendered ways, um, women are burdened to actually keep themselves safe. This is seen all across the globe where there is this narratives that are victim blaming, saying, oh, what did you wear when you went outside and you got sexually harassed, right? You all would understand. In the same sense, Rohingya women were told to get you know, closer and closer to home, to not go to the university, to not go to a hospital, to not really participate anymore in the society. I remember my mom telling me, you know, at her, at, um, in her time when she was in, in Rakhine State, no woman would actually go out and, and go to the market and buy things for, their, for themselves. They would task young children or they would task their husband to actually do that for them because they're not to be seen. And this is what I call the invisibilization of women. Because they're still carrying all these domestic labor, but it's not seen. They're still the glue for the community, keeping everyone alive, keeping everyone fed, making sure there's food enough for the families first before themselves. But they're not seen, they're not heard from. And this was done strategically to keep women further and further away from political, social, economic participation. Now, women's sexuality is used as an indicator of human dignity, but not her own human dignity. It's her husband's, it's an attachment to her male family members. And this is why the military has actually decided to target women in terms of sexual and gender-based violence, because when they do that, it's a violation of men, and the men gets angry at women. Counterproductive. Always. But it comes back to women to protect themselves, right? But in an authoritarian regime, you can't really get mad at the oppressor because you can't change them. Therefore, they direct and project their anger onto women. Genocidal rape was already talked about, and we already talked about the roles uh, that women have in society. Um, I won't be showing you about the soldiers that deflect. It's, it's, uh, it's already sort of talked about, covered uh, online. Um, if you're interested, please feel free to go and search about it. It's, uh, it's a very important uh, um, move from these two soldiers who were actually um, parts of the genocidal campaigns in 2017 to have um, rushed and, and ran from uh, Rakhine State into Bangladeshi uh, 
control, and Bangladesh uh, government actually send them over to the Hague. They're now being held up at the ICC. Now, women's role in the past was not quite well known because our community um, historically have always been the oral society. We've always been communities that pass down <coughs> wisdoms and pass down knowledge through traditions, through teaching, through um, you know, verbal experience. And so when it comes to um, you know, the lack or the erasure of Rohingya, it's done quite easily because the more disintegrated a community is, the more, um, the, the harder it is for the community to come together and, and learn and, and try to carry on these, this wisdom, this heritage. So women serving in leadership positions or contributing uh, to the society was all lost. Um, there were so many photos of women back in the days prior to 1942 and after, before 1982, were a lot of photos of young women who dressed just very much similar to you know the culture of um, the, the the common culture around Myanmar today, where they wear heavy, where they wear um, long sleeve shirts, and they actually don't cover their hair. Sometimes they do. Usually, when they go to university, they don't. And not to say that covering one's hair or not covering is is, is anything at all, but. That is, you know, the current pictures that you see of Rohingya women today is not true to what we were or who we once were. And that's all lost. Um, another story I want to share is, you know, we, we used to have grandmothers who used to be so wise and so knowledgeable <coughs> and lots of community members who come to them for advice um, when there is a conflict. There would be a, a bunch of them who would come to these uh, to these women and ask for you know for mediation, and I would call this grandmother's diplom uh, diplomacy. Um, it was very vibrant back then, and men come to them to actually seek advice. This was all lost. Women no longer have those roles. So, in the refugee camps, just to briefly mention to you, um, there's continuous lack of food, lack of water, lack of um, necessities, funds are dwindling, dome fatigue is a thing. Um, there's pervasive sexual and gender-based violence, which is very well documented in world research. When you pair young men, pent up energy, you know, coming from a very, very oppressive um, situations in Wakhine State and now living in the limbo in Bangladesh, in Cox's Bazaar, in the camps, and having lack of necessities you're going to have crimes. That's just a really, really disastrous combination. So sexual and gender-based violence is on the rise. It doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. There's a lot of labor exploitation from INGOs and from authorities um, in Bangladesh. Sex trafficking, human trafficking is a really huge problem on a regional level. But starting from Rakhine and mostly from uh, Bangladesh. Access to education is almost non-existent because there's a clamping down of these educational initiatives that is done by the community. And so, to to preface this a little bit, it's important to note that the survival of the Rohingya has not been solely because the international community is paying attention to us. It is the community themselves, the agents in the community, who send money home, who find ways to actually figure out the economy of, you know, uh, finding out ways to actually send money and support their, their families under repression. And some of them have actually continued to uh, traffic themselves in order to find other prospects so that they can support their families. And all of these educational, informal educational initiatives that have been closed down are all funded and run by the community. This is part of the agency that's continuing to be uh, um, uh, barricaded and the it seems that people in the Rohingya crisis response just seem to not understand that without involving Rohingya in all of these different processes they will not be able to push us away into Rakhine State back home while the current situation is still quite bad nor would they actually have 
uh, uh, stable conditions in the camps while they're you know, pushing us to the edge. COVID-19 has exacerbated all of these you know, uh, pre-existing conditions, including constant fires, which seems very much intentional, also the flooding and continuously um, creating landslides. So from an unstable conditions in Rakhine State, you transfer over, there is also instability inside uh, Cox's Bazaar. When you have an authoritarian regime that is not dealt with, and they don't face accountability on an international level, there's no repercussion for their behaviors, just like in 2011 when they did the trial run, and now in 2017 when they actually carried out a full-blown genocidal campaign, continuously to, to um, continuing to do so, you are basically, collectively, and that, um, and, and regionally, the, we are actually basically giving the license to other states to treat these populations the same way, or worse. Now, talking a little bit about the main part of this, taking back agency. I'm so sorry if I have bored you to death. Taking back agency. I have talked to a lot of people in 2020, just before the pandemic hit, and these are just some of the pictures that I have gathered. I guess, you know, pictures are better than nothing. Um, children have very low quality of life, continuously facing nutritional, uh, malnutrition and, and uh, issues with water. Um, salmonella is really bad there. Healthcare facilities not accessible, and it's bad. It's worse now. Civil society uh, groups continuously um, are being surveilled. I've had a lot of friends and colleagues who were picked up by the uh, uh, Special Branch Police on the day of um, genocide commemoration on every August 25th. We, we do this thing globally. And um, they usually are picked up the night before and then they're released after <coughs> August 25th because the Bangladeshi authority are just probably scared that they're going to organize or do something. Uh, the only thing that they do is basically just gather and talk about you know what happened but even that is not allowed they are not allowed to gather for more than seven people at the time that i was visiting i think it's worse now the <laughs> however the community continues to explore ways to work together they are completely um, trying to innovate new ways creating new ways to work to serve the community with whatever means and and limited capacity Again, about invisible labor and, and overshadowed agency. The community-run school, as I've mentioned, is completely run by us, very with a little bit of help by external entities, but usually the initiatives are you know, uh, uh, taken by the community. And to give you another like very clear-cut example, universal jurisdiction case in Argentina was actually initiated by the community, by um, the Burmese Rohingya, um, organization in UK and all of the justice mechanism that we see today, ICJ, ICC, UN fact-finding mission, um, independent independent investigative mechanism of Myanmar, all are as all are actually results of communities hard work and dedication. We've actually been at this for more than three decades. It's a little bit too long, don't you think? There are also continuous efforts in documentations and storytelling. These are some of the women that I want to show you because I don't think we talk about them enough. That, on the, on the um, very right side, is Shokotara. She's a very staunch, prominent uh, women leader in the camps who have done a lot of work. One of the, you know, one of the ways that they combat uh, fear and insecurity in the camps where women are you know, continuously harassed and, and uh, sexually harassed when they go out at night or walk around um, or go to the bathroom relieving themselves. One of the things that I think will put things into uh, perspective is that, you know, 10 families, at the very least, 10 families share one bathroom. Women don't have privacy in the morning. And at night, the areas are too dark for them to actually go. And just imagine not being able to go to the washroom when you need it imagine what, what that would do to your psyche, right? Another thing is, the only food that is available for you in the camps are, uh, and, and the ration that's given by UNHCR or IOM 
uh, or other organizations that do food, food distribution, like World Food Program, is rice and lentil. Imagine just eating that every single day. What do you think would it? What do you think that would do to your to your body, to your to your, to your uh, mental stability? So she does a lot of good work. One of which is organizing women to go out at night and surveilling around the area just to make sure that everyone's safe. And that's you know what they've been able to do, even with that limit you know limits uh, on their agency, limits on their ability to work, um, and all these you know. Uh, a securitization measure and, and all these clamping down on, on activists. This is Razia Sultana, she does a lot of great work, especially in documentation. She wrote a report uh, that's called Rape by Command. I really encourage you to actually explore it if you can. Um, and she also has a center um, that focuses on healing um, sexual and gender based violence, uh, uh, you know, uh, surviving. So lots of people actually have joined her. And uh, initiatives, this is purely run by her. Very few um, donations from bigger organizations. This is Wei Reinu, very prominent human rights lawyer. Razia is also a human rights lawyer. Um, Wei Reinu has done a lot of work to create alliance within uh, Myanmar, to create awareness that Rohingya exist and won't go anywhere. And uh, she has done a lot of work, like friendship projects, friendship campaign, where she reaches out to other ethnic communities, of course, having to, you know, face all these barriers and racism towards her, um, but you know, she persisted, and she has risen to become one of the most prominent um, Rohingya women activists. Um, these are just pictures from, you know, from from programs um, in the camps that teaches vocational training. These are just consultation that the UN Women have done. In the white scarf, that's Lucky, who has the opportunity to actually get scholarship from Asia University. So there are, you know, very capable people in the mix. Um, even though we've we've been deprived of education for the past three generations, women like Lucky exist. She actually had done a lot of self-study and got admitted. She now graduated and are looking to actually help more women to actually go to school and try to secure places for them in Asia University. That's the only university in Bangladesh that they can go to um, without repercussion, but they have to be extremely careful and not letting anybody know. So Lucky has done a lot of work in that, and this is the same woman that we saw earlier. Um, this is through, you know, website uh, Oxfam, and uh, they do this thing where they generate power for, for different uh, areas that are not really well lit, so that women can actually um, go walk around just being able to walk around. Here's me. <laughs> and this was the first time that we actually had anything like this. Uh, there was, before this, I don't think that I understood the impact or, or the enormity of, of the initiatives that we've taken in Canada. So initially I did not know anything about advocacy, just stumbling in the dark. And this is just an encouragement for you to start wherever you are, doesn't really matter. You'll eventually know what to do. Um, but what we did was, you know, we did a lot of genocide documentation, but the documentation was solely focusing on the Rohingya resilience in Canada, in the Canadian context. So we talked to a lot of uh, members of our community, and that went on to become the archive, um, national archive in the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. So it you know, goes to show that now Rohingya are actually part and parcels of the Canadian society which is really monumental um, when I think of it. So our work extends beyond, you know, far, far beyond what you see portrayed about us, a very limited version of us. We are not just victims, we're not just waiting for a helping hand, we're not just waiting for food rations every day, we're taking the initiatives. If you want to look at what Rohingya would be capable of doing, and we are not the best example that you can see, look at the, uh, look at the ability of the diaspora to actually persist and persevere um, and resiliently work for the community. That would be a proper um, representation. But even on the ground, with all these limitations, people have still been able to create so much with so little. So I don't want to hear about these like victimization, victimized narratives that we really are just void of our agency because we have, we've done our part. It's the international community that's, that have actually failed to protect us. And continuously, 
they fail to help us, to empower us, to become self-reliant. Now, this museum exhibition was actually born out of you know, community members coming together and advocating at the museums to make sure that the museum take away the picture, the portrait of the noble Peace Christ, uh, Peace Christ Laureate. And uh, because her picture was actually shown and portrayed as a human rights icon, but she denied outright that Rohingya exists in the country. On top of that, she framed, or she said to the media that Rohingya women are, you know, just claiming to be to be raped. It's all fake rapes. This is internalized misogyny we're seeing. So we have done a lot of work <coughs> with the museum and continuously pushed back against their their you know complacency. And eventually, they agreed that there was a genocide that took place. And eventually, they gave us this this ability to create and curate the the exhibition, um, which was there for about two years prior, um, I think it ended about uh, around two years ago, maybe in 2020. And this was the first time that the word Rohingya is written really prominently in a museum, you know, in the entire world. And the acceptance of the name itself has so much power to it uh, because we've been called something else all our lives. And so a federal institution, calling us Rohingya by our names and acknowledging the contribution that we make to the Canadian society and really accepting us and, and putting us in, into their museum, first of all, was huge for, for a community. So that's Bob Wade. That's the president of the museum. That's another important, um, that's another important uh, uh, mon mon monumental victory for us. Burma's Path to Genocide, the exhibition about Rohingya in the Holocaust Museum, as I mentioned earlier, is a huge part in curating and narrating the, the third woman making. So this is like community coming together, trying to find the mother of these children. And they found them, and these women became lifelong friends. <coughs> Genocide, rebuilding, art, healing, accountability needs to be Accountability cannot just be dry, cut, and just talked about, you know, oh, we have to hold perpetrators accountable. I don't think that will help the community in the long run. The community that faced erasure needs their revival of the literature, of their art. This is something that we do. My mom had told me of her stories of, you know, embroidery. That was the craft that a lot of Rohingya women have and have been able to, you know, perfect but it's lost in the circumstance when uh, fabric is not easy to, to come by, where materials is, is just out of the question, when food is, is you know, in question, there's nothing else that you can focus on. But these are just some of the things that you know, some initiatives have, have actually provided, and they were actually able to tell some stories of what they thought of their homeland. This is just the embroidery of, of people thinking back and missing their own homeland. This is another uh, mural that exist and unfortunately was destroyed in one of the big fires. Um, this was by Art Lucian, an organization that works on art and you know, trying to create revolution through art. Um, and they have actually uh, recruited all of these Rohingya people, men and women, to actually create murals all around the camps, just as an ex expression of their agency, just to showcase that they're capable. They're very much human, like you and me. Here's my passion project that I'm really proud of. <laughs> um, Hafsa and the Magical Ring is my children's book that I have been able to collaborate with Google, Google's Books and Asia Foundation. There are four separate books that will come out in summer. Um, so if you would like to check them out, please go to their website. I think they're going to add um, a pre-order option sometime soon, like in this week. So just note down the name. And the other one is The White Elephant, which is uh, authored by my, my colleague, Mayu Ali. He has many other books if you want to explore some of his work. He's also a poet. Um, we collaborated with them in this sort of like a harmony building project with two other Bangladeshi authors and uh, basically created these stories that we think will help the young children at the camps, basically the first audience that we're targeting, are the children at the camps 
in my um, in my own views, I'm trying to um, send a love letter to them from myself and trying to say to them that they're seen and I see them and their pain is not minimized and someday we will get out of this. Um, this is also you know, another attempt of us telling the story, creating our own narratives and taking back our own agency. Rohingya book that we showed earlier, which you can order now anywhere if you don't like Amazon, which I understand why. Um, there's also other websites that you can, can search up. Um, I Am a Rohingya Poetry was actually an initiative that started out in the camps um, where James and Shazar went to the camps and trained um, young people, young poets who can write a lot of you know, poet, uh, poetry in, in Rohingya language. It's beautiful. If, you, if there's any language that I can probably be biasly say that is beautiful, it's probably Rohingya language. Um, and some of this, you know, some of the poems that exist in this book actually is in Rohingya. And there's a translation that's made uh, right after. So this is one attempt, another attempt that just came out, um, and you can find this online as well, Rohingya Folk Tip. Uh, an important part to tell you about what our history was like or what, you know, what agency is like. Um, and the illustrations done by Rohingya, um, everything is sort of, you know, coming from the Rohingya initiatives. There's also attempts to actually revive language. And we are now codifying the language into Rohingya. -ish. So there are characters that are written in English, but it's pronounced in Rohingya language. So um, if you search in YouTube, there are, there are some uh, channels that are teaching you how to, how to speak in Rohingya. So that's exciting. And um, there are other you know, oral history and archives and publications that will constantly come out. So please check that out if you have the ability to. Finally, I'm not going to go through all of these information. You can definitely find out for yourself. Um, since Myanmar, um, uh, fall into the coup in, on February 1st, 2021. Uh, there had been a lot of widespread uh, violence that took place. Journalists have been uh, jailed. A lot of them are being targeted, are being chased. Uh, General Min Aung is now a prime minister. And there is a civil disobedience movement, which I think is important for everyone to support. Um, because they came out and actually acknowledged that uh, Rohingya people you know, initially the, the narratives within the country was that Rohingya don't exist, this was all, you know, fake, none of this happened, genocide never happened. But then now, when the country is embroiled in widespread violence and the, and the military is going to take, you know, and, and seize the country by any means possible, especially through violence being, um, they decided, okay, I think you guys didn't lie. And they decided to acknowledge that, you know, publicly. So we are working with a lot of young people, although we have to navigate you know, the different um, pre-existing biases and stereotypes that has just been circulated for far too long. Um, we are working together and we are supporting the national unity government in order to take back the country, take back the control with the conditions that they will actually um, <coughs> You know, do some work in terms of reparations for Rohingya and actually help Rohingya to reintegrate into the society. And what that means will be, you know, uh, really uh, placed upon what the community really wants. So that would be, you know, the, the, that's why we need the agency of Rohingya to be recognized in Bangladesh so that they have the ability to uh, create skills or, or actually. Um, learn how to, you know, how to become even more resilient, how to, how to do certain things in order to sustain themselves until they can go back home. So that's the, you know, the tall, the, the dream, uh, the goal eventually. And if we don't imagine what is possible, we probably will ever get there. So that's one thing. And these are just a map for you to see which country have been involved in these different things. Um, arm sales, defense equipment, um, suspending military aid to, to, uh, to military actors. There are a lot of democratic countries involved. And I don't think until, uh, it was not until um, the coup took place 
that a lot of these countries actually decided to become more self-reflective, um, which is really sad because a genocide never justified this kind of actions, but a political change, really? So as a student or, or you know, as faculty members, I, I think one way to combat this is there, there needs to be more self-reflection in how we are all implicated in all of these atrocities. And how we can help is, I think, one way, community building, reaching out to people, talking, relating to each other more on a human level. It sounds very abstract and very, you know, oh, touchy-feely, but it actually has a real-world implication. It actually has um, implications when, when we don't pay attention to what happens to other human beings, this kind of thing happens. Now, I like this slide a lot. <laughs> Smashing patriarchy is our common ground. Let me explain a little bit. So on that side, Kala Razia, my, my beloved auntie, who has been working really tirelessly for the community and has been trying to train women to understand, she's a feminist herself, um, have been trying to train the women to understand that they have the upper hand. They do. They are the glue of the community. They have done a lot of invisible work. They can take back the power. So a lot of these um, different posters are like, you know, the written, um, cards are all about, you know, I want my daughter to not have to live my life. Um, you know, uh, women have the power and uh, the power of change in my honors. All of these are very positive messages show, showcasing that they're accepting the ideas that they actually are in charge and the men in the community as much as they are, you know, also at the receiving end of violence and, and you know, all of these targets they should not impose the, um, the violence upon women as a, as a channel of expression or, or a channel to express their frustration. So this side is after the coup, um, after the, the staging of the coup, the military, one, one of the things that's very, very true in the Myanmar military uh, system is that all the men are quite misogynistic. Not a surprise, but the men are scared of touching women's lower garment because we menstruate, we bleed, they see us as dirty. I know Zakia was talking about this earlier in the conference. Um, and so, with this mindset, the young women in the protest, in the democratic movement, right after the coup, when there was a, uh, when we were at the height of, um, you know, people were trying to fight back and really they were showing up on the streets. Now it kind of shifted, the civil disobedience movement shifted into, you know, not letting the military assume control and not letting it uh, become business as usual. And it, it can shift over time. But the military, the, the, the bottom line is they have, they still have yet to seize the control of the country and they're running out of money, which is important. That's why, you know, cutting uh, economic flow of arms or, or um, economic ties with the military is important. Now, to this picture, a <laughs> bunch of uh, young women activists actually put up the lower garment of women. The one thing that the men fear, the military men fear, is that they would actually go under the, the garments and their sacredness will actually be compromised. Mm -hmm. As if killing people won't do that, mm -hmm. right? And then they don't even dare touching it. They have to actually go and slowly pluck one at a time down because they're fearful of seven people, as I mentioned. So in the commemoration of the genocide on August 25th in 2020, they, they had to figure out a way to actually showcase their resistance and their dissatisfaction of the current system, of the INGOs, of the Bangladeshi Authority on clamping down on their agency. So they actually strung up all these masks to showcase each person on a field. And you can see it's, it's really far. It stretches all across the field. This basically signifies one person at a time. And they said, no consultation, no solution. And I'll end it here. Thank you.